your space a little bit, you have uh, your inflationary arena. And uh, the rest of the lectures will be about computing this uh, primordial, the statistics of primordial fluctuations. So I'll start. Somehow the volume is going up. Is that a... No. Okay. So uh, we're going to focus on mostly on computing higher point functions, but first I need to review how uh, the two-point function is computed. And for that, I'm going to use the standard canonical quantization. But then uh, in the second half of the lectures, I'll talk about some new stuff in the past uh, four or so years, maybe five years, um, about leveraging symmetries of this arena to compute these uh, inflationary fluctuations without actually referring to you know, the, space, the bulk space time. So we call this the bootstrap because you're leveraging like basic rules of physics like symmetries, locality, unitarity, and so on to try to write down the answer under a set of assumptions without actually going through the standard brute force method. Okay? So that will be towards the end. Um, I encourage you to ask, uh, well, you've been here for two weeks, but I encourage you to interrupt me, ask questions, and uh, if it's too slow, you let me know. If it's too fast, you let me know. Just please give me feedback, okay? So I will start actually with some motivation for why we care, uh, why we're interested in this, and where, or maybe I'll say a few things about, about the future. But, well, uh, given that this is a school about uh, fundamental theory, I guess you're probably interested about the initial conditions of the universe, right? How does the universe get kick-started? And um, so that's one good motivation for being interested in these lectures. Another good mot motivation is, um, is related to, the, to well, what cosmology boils down to in some sense. So uh, in cosmology, we, we look up at the, in the sky and we see some uh, structure. We see you know, fluctuations in the large-scale structure of the universe. We see you know, uh, hot and cold spots in the cosmic microwave background. And they are not scattered at random. There is a lot of structure in the way that these uh, fluctuations are imprinted. And we have to tell ourselves a story that you know, is, can be res responsible for generating these imprints. Okay? So, you know, we have probes of the, of the different eras of the universe. So, for example, we have here a snapshot of the large-scale structure of the universe, LSS, large-scale structure. So we have, like, you know, galaxies, and we have, like, filaments of, uh, of you know, dark matter and so on. And uh, there are non-trivial correlations imprinted in these, uh, in these uh, density fluctuations. And then we see we have different probes, you know, so we're mostly going to be studying. So we have some non-trivial two-point function. We fix some separation, and we average the, the products of density fluctuations on these two different spots, average over the sky. Uh, we also like to look at, say, three-point functions. So there's some triangle here we want to correlate for a fixed uh, triangle shape, all of these uh, different points in the sky. And uh, and also at four points, OK? So we're, we're mostly going to be interested in these, uh, in these low point correlation functions. Because these fluctuations are very weak, the, the more points you look at, the fainter the signal will be. So realistically, we only go uh, as far as three or four points. Okay? And the same thing happens in the CMB, in the, in the cosmic microwave background. If you go back to higher redshift earlier times, we have the cosmic microwave background radiation here. We have like these uh, beautiful pictures. Of course, I can't reproduce the pictures, but there's like these beautiful pictures by, you know, of these fluctuations by, by Planck and so on. I hope you're imagining the actual map from Planck. There's like some uh, cold spots and some hot spots and so on. And again, you, now you look at temperature or polarization fluctuations and you, you look at the same types of observables. Sorry about the shock. 
And so time is going up. So finally, if we trace these things back to the hot Big Bang, you know, uh, the supposed beginning of hot Big Bang cosmology, so then we still see some uh, correlations. Okay? And at two points, at least, which we can measure in the data, these correlations have a very simple shape. So at two points, we have something uh, uh, pretty much almost scaling variance. So we have some imprinted amount of power here. And uh, we need to explain how this comes about because this is, in Big Bang cosmology, this is the beginning of the universe. But there is already non-trivial long distance correlations, okay? which is a little bit of a puzzle. But uh, if you heard about inflation, you probably you're probably aware of how this is solved. We give more time for these correlations to be set up, but we'll get there later. And uh, we, if we see these uh, three and four point functions in the sky, we also need to tell some sort of history. So it's really about observing these patterns, these spatial patterns in the sky and inferring time evolution from it. So in some sense, there is a, a, an extra dimension of space-time that emerges from these uh, observations because there is no inherent time evolution. We're only observing a snapshot of the cosmic history of the universe, but we have to infer, I mean, these correlations can't be imprinted randomly. They have to come from local standard physics that happened during some earlier era that we can't probe directly. So that's uh, one motivation for, for studying this. Of course, you can postulate a given history of space-time and then go through like some machinery of quantum field theory and compute what this will give you at the hot Big Bang surface. But the idea of uh, the bootstrap is, well, maybe if I use some basic principles that the fluctuations realize some symmetries and uh, you know, that physics is local and so on, then I can more or less in a model independent way characterize all possible shapes of correlation functions. Okay? And it turns out that in a, in a class of uh, inflationary models, we can actually do that and completely classify all possible shapes of low point non Gaussianity, okay? of low point correlation functions. So this is one uh, motivation. It's like practical because we really want to measure these things in the sky and explore what physics gives rise to them. And it would, we would like to have a theory of the templates, you know, what possible shapes of uh, primordial fluctuations can uh, be generated from some previous cosmic history. And there are also more uh, theoretical, more... Um, related to developments in string theory, motivations to think about, uh, you know, just keeping yourself anchored to this uh, particular time slice and trying to figure out what are the rules of the game of objects defined on this particular time slice. So if you, if you studied a little bit of string theory, you probably heard about the ADS-CFT correspondence, which is this... Um, duality between quantum gravity and a standard quantum field theory, but the quantum field theory is defined in a lower dimensional space-time, okay? So, uh, so you replace, so, okay, this is a separate story, but it's related to this. So in, in the ADS-CFT correspondence, you have, you have some theory of quantum gravity, maybe some strings and so on, uh, defined in some uh, higher dimensional space-time. And then the idea is that this is equivalent. This is equivalent to some standard quantum field theory, but defined only at the boundary. Okay. So it should remind you a little bit of this uh, story here. So uh, if you make the parallel, we have this uh, hot Big Bang. 
surface here. And we're interested in these uh, cosmological correlation functions, uh, two, three, and four points. And we want to understand some rules of how these uh, fluctuations talk to each other. And if we understand these rules well enough, we're going to see that they, are, they can be reinterpreted as some interesting physics going on in some higher dimensional space-time, where time emerges in some sense. Okay, so here, for example, you'd have like some, some pair of particles that are produced, and then the pair goes off. Each particle goes off its, in its own way. The space-time expands, and then you set up some non-trivial correlation at late time. So then we're interested in what sorts of stories I can tell that will set up these uh, correlation functions here. Okay? So there's some magic going on here, and we, we want to understand if we can classify all possible stories, and then if we can understand it just from these, uh, some rules for how the fluctuations are impinged in this spatial surface. Okay? So this is some uh, motivational part. Okay? So it's not like we're, we really need to assume ADS-CFT or that here there are strings or something like that. It's just morally equivalent. Something perhaps uh, more closer to standard particle physics is that the S matrix the flat space S matrix is somehow well defined in, at null infinity. Okay, so yet another version of a hologram, albeit it's way less understood, is uh, in flat space. So this is a Penrose diagram. Is everyone familiar with this? Uh, so if I draw this napkin, do you see flat space here? Or? So this, is, uh, so this is flat space and this is null infinity. So this is where uh, light-like particles end up their, their lives. So there's some uh, interesting non-trivial scattering process go going on. I send in some particles and then off they go. And uh, the idea, the hope is that there, and that's uh, probably Nima is going to uh, spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, the, the hope is that there is some objects that is defined here or even in some uh, completely different auxiliary, uh, you know, geometrical space-time. So, so there will be some objects. So let me just uh, depict it like this. Uh, this is a cartoon. So there will be something where, you know, you just uh, put some mark some points on this surface and you ask for certain rules of the game to be obeyed and uh, some object that is very well defined just here somehow correctly encodes uh, bulk evolution here. Okay? And uh, this is probably a very important thing to be understood because eventually in quantum gravity uh, local field theory uh, is in a little bit of trouble because in quantum gravity local Fields are gauge, or, or, uh, they don't carry purely physical information. They always carry a little bit of extra junk because they are charged under the gauge group of gravity. They're not gauge invariance operators, okay? So these things defined in the boundary, they're like gauge invariant in some sense. So they're, they're, they are protected from, they're true operators of quantum gravity so we can study their correlation functions. And from this example here of uh, physics in anti de Sitter space and uh, being dual to some quantum field theory, some boundary of this uh, geometry, we expect that there is some sense, in some sense, this uh, lesson has to be true in these other space times. Okay? So this is the example where the cosmological constant is negative, is very well understood. This is the example of the S matrix. Here's the cosmological constant is zero. It's reasonably well understood. That's probably what Neiman is going to be mostly talking about. And this, as I'll try to convince you in these lectures, we are just starting to understand how.
of the what the rules are. Okay. All right. Um, okay. One last thing uh, about uh, going back to going back to this uh, picture here is if we infer this uh, the correct story of what gave rise to these correlations, as I'll try to convince you later, so because of this uh, collider physics, you can really think of this as uh, some sort of collider experiment. Okay? So in, in inflation, the energy scales, so there will be some uh, period, I'm getting slightly ahead of myself, but there is some period that sets up these initial correlations. And uh, in some sense, you can think of this initial period as some particle collider experiment at some energy, fixed energy scale. And this energy scale is, can be potentially huge, much bigger than any energy scale that we can access, even with the LHC. So the idea is if you have such a powerful uh, particle collider, can you do collider physics with this? And uh, the answer is yes. And why do we care? Well, first of all, this is probably the highest energy available in nature. So if we want to understand, you know, what are the ultimate building blocks of our universe, this might be a good place to look. Second, the energy scale is so high, who knows, maybe you can touch base with uh, crazy stuff like string theory and if maybe there's a chance to test these ideas uh, in, this, in this setup, okay? So that's uh, another, another motivation for why we're interested in this. Of course, we want to tell a consistent history of our universe, but also this can potentially give us access to a window of energies that is completely out of reach from current particle colliders. So I hope that by now you're motivated because if you're not, everything else will be technical. But uh, this is the this is the actual motivation for for uh, studying those things. Okay. Any questions? All right. So let's get started. Uh, let's see. So now I'll take a step back and start real slow. So an interesting uh, aspect of, uh, of space times with curvature or, or curved field space in general is that uh, there, well, there, there are two things that don't happen in flat space. So let's start with uh, some QFT in curved space and in particular quantum mechanics. So we can see those things even in quantum mechanics. And this is largely based on an example discussed uh, in detail in the textbook by uh, uh, Mukhanov and Vinitsky. So it's called QFT in curved space, I think, the textbook. So all credits goes to them for this example. So uh, the idea of studying QFT in curved space is to, uh, we're interested, we're interested in quantum fields in a high occupation number. So some classical uh, background. Okay. So there are two general features of uh, studying quantum fields now in a curved background instead of a, a flat background. So. So feature number one is uh, that the vacuum is somehow ambiguous. And uh, well, 
pretty much related to this is that uh, you have, depending on what you call vacuum, you have the phenomenon of sp spontaneous particle production. Okay. So, and this is this spontaneous particle production is crucial to inflation. Somehow, in inflation, you have a curved arena. And uh, this uh, curvature uh, gives rise to spontaneous particle production. And it's this uh, spontaneous particle production that sets up uh, these initial correlations in the universe. Okay? So I will discuss the example of a uh, harmonic oscillator, but with some background switched on and here the background will just be that uh, the mass or the, or the frequency of the harmonic oscillator is time dependent. Okay. So example <laughs> harmonic oscillator with time-dependent mass. So you consider harmonic oscillator, the uh, Lagrangian is given by this, half q dot squared minus half u of t q squared. Everyone uh, uh, comfortable with the idea that quantum mechanics and q of t in zero plus one are the same thing, right? So the this field Q is the coordinates of the harmonic oscillator. And now, so now I have some background switched on, which is this U of T. So it's a, uh, it's a externally given function, U of T. And because we know how to quantize the harmonic oscillator, I'm going to take this function U of T to have some fixed asymptotic value. I'm going to write it to be E omega squared. And then it switches on and does something interesting for a while. This is not symmetric, okay? So it's just whatever, whatever you want it to be. So this is U of t over time, okay? And there's some uh, t. Uh, let's see how I call it. Let me call it a T in, T out. So before some time, it's really like your standard harmonic oscillator. And after some time, it's also like your standard harmonic oscillator. But then somewhere in between, it has this uh, interesting time-dependent feature. Okay? So, well, how do you quantize a harmonic oscillator? So what you do is uh, you promote these. Uh, so first of all, you write the, the classical equation of motion for the harmonic oscillator. So so the classical equation of motion is given by U classical double dot plus U of T Q classical equals zero. Okay. And then once you found a solution, then the idea is that the quantum operator Q hat of T is equal to um, Q classical. You pick some solution A plus Q classical star A dagger, okay? And the time dependence is uh, in the... So now the, the, there will be some interesting time dependence in these uh, Q classical things, and uh, a, a dagger conventionally uh, have this commutator, 
And in principle, that's it. Okay? But now there's some, there's some ambiguity. Let's go back to the standard harmonic oscillator. So in the standard harmonic oscillator, if, uh, if u of t equals omega squared, then q classical is e to the minus i omega t, right? the standard solution of the equation of motion. Okay. By the way, uh, question. So in principle, there are two solutions of this equation, right? So why not Q classical bar some alpha So why not? Sorry? Uh, what do you mean by causality? I'm, I'm just... Uh, well, maybe it's related to causality. But there is a, there is a simpler... There is a, hmm? Well, uh, you... Well... So what you call A must annihilate the vacuum, right? But what goes in front of A is this Q classical. So, but why can't you take this linear combination? It's just a, as well a good solution of the classical equation. So why can't you put this linear combination in front of A? You said the right word, vacuum. So what's the property of the vacuum that we need to ensure? It's the lowest energy state. So if you put if you put your your generic solution here and you try to minimize, now you compute the expectation value of H uh, in, in the vacuum for this given solution, you see that it will only be minimal if uh, you take the linear combination where this is one and this is zero. Okay, so that's that's why. So so this is what you would do. But now you have, uh, so, okay, so if you look up uh, in that picture there, so we know what to do for t less than t in and t greater than t out, okay? And actually, if you're really careful, uh, then you probably put the square root of 2 omega downstairs to ensure that, that uh, this is true, okay? So if a a dagger commutes 1, then the root 2 omega must be here because of... Uh, Heisenberg commutation relations, okay? So that Q uh, commutator with P is one, is I, sorry, okay? So now you say, oh, I'm good. I know what to do. I just stare at that thing. I take a solution that at very early times will give me E to the minus I omega T. So easy. Okay. So for t less than t in, take q classical e to the minus i omega t over root 2 omega. OK, great. But now you're a contrarian. You say, well, but again, for t greater than t out, I can say the same thing. Or for t greater than t out, take q classical, OK? So which one is correct? Actually, the, the, they're both correct, OK? So there is no, there's no clear, I mean, what, what one calls vacuum, if you wish, is time dependent or frame dependent. So what one would call vacuum, here at late times is different than what one would call vacuum at early times. Because if you try to solve this equation, so now you have to solve the, the equation q double dot classical plus u of t q classical equals 0. And then uh, if you impose that for t less than t in q classical equals this Uh, let me call this in. 
then there's no reason why at late times you, also, you don't have freedom anymore. Okay? You already picked one of the solutions and you even fixed the coefficient. So now you're done. So whatever the function u of t is, it will determine how the, this q classical behaves at late times. So q classical in at late times for t greater than t out will generically be a linear combination of Okay, and the facts that we see now, we don't see vacuum, uh, the vacuum wave function at late times is related to particle production. Okay, so that's why I see particles at late time. So if I calibrate my, my counter to, you know, see no particles at early times, then I let things evolve, and then I go and observe things at late times, I'll see particles, okay, and vice versa. Is that clear? So now because there is a source, if, if the source was constant, of course, if you were to, com these, uh, these quantities alpha and beta will depend on u. Okay, so they're functions of u. And uh, they come from the, you know, from you solving, from you solving carefully the classical equation of motion. But once you know alpha and beta fixed by u, if, if u is a constant, then this is zero. Okay. But otherwise, generically, you will expect to see these, these coefficients around. So you will see particle production. And for the person that likes to observe things at late times, this person can play exactly the same game, but now with the roles inverted. Okay. So. So. so this is called the in vacuum. Okay, so Q can be written now as uh, Q classical in. You picked a particular classical solution. And this, this uh, annihilation operator is called the in annihilation operator. And because it's a real field, you better put the complex conjugates here. A dagger in. And there is a state called the in vacuum, such that A in annihilates it. Okay, so this is called the in vacuum. But now you can do the same story for later times. So for, for uh, T greater than T out, you pick a different classical solution. Let's call it Q out e to the minus i omega t. And then for t less than t in, uh, we'll go to. <laughs> Have I written this somewhere? Okay, let me just give different letters that are actually related. So gamma e to the minus Okay. So now if I write the Q hat operator as Q classical out A out plus Q classic. With A out annihilating some states. So this is called the out vacuum. Okay. All right. So there's some vacuum ambiguity. Now, if you study quantum field theory in flat space, you'll say, no big deal. In and out vacuum are different in flat space scattering. So that's why we always divide, we always uh, look at, uh, you know, some time order correlation function divided by some in-out uh, matrix element. 
So that's why when we compute scattering amplitudes, we always throw away vacuum bubble diagrams. These vacuum bubble diagrams are taking into account precisely this overlap between the in and out state. But uh, crucial points of, of flat space quantum field theory, if you switch on and off the interactions adiabatically, is that the in and the out vacuum do have non-trivial overlap, but it's a phase. Okay? In particular, if you take the mod squared uh, uh, between in and out states, it's one. Okay, so the, the in vacuum will go into the out vacuum at late times. Here, this is not the case. There is really spontaneous particle production. You will see particles at late times. Therefore, if you start from the in vacuum at earlier times, you will not, with probability one, end up in the out vacuum at late times. Okay? Yeah, but here, uh, well, there is no notion of vacuum that is well-defined everywhere. Here, you have two asymptotic regions in which it looks like the vacuum is pretty well-defined, but they don't agree with each other. So that's, uh, that's what's going on. Okay, is that clear? So somehow the, the interesting time dependence that you switched on will... Uh, give you a uh, notion of particles at, uh, at late times, okay? All right, so let, let's just write down what I just said in, wor in words. So in general, in is not equal to out, okay? But to use Feynman perturbation theory when, when we use Feynman perturbation theory, then we are using this assumption here, in equals e to the i theta out. In particular, out overlaps with in squared equals one. Okay, so it's a phase. But the, the, the key point is that for general backgrounds, in our case u of t, this is not true. This is not the case. Okay, so there's spontaneous particle production. Um, I will just state things as a fact, and uh, later after class, if you're interested, I can tell you how that's derived, but just uh, to you know to uh, make you confused and interested, I will give you the result for this uh, for this uh, overlap if you know alpha and beta. So somehow all the information about U of t is encoded in these coefficients alpha and beta. For a given u, it's uh, it's. Uh, Given the u, you find this alpha and beta here. And you might be uh, asking about gamma and delta, but gamma and delta through unitarity are related to alpha and beta. So somehow the information is just being scrambled. It's the same information here. By the way, how do you think you would go about uh, in matching gamma and delta to alpha and beta? Do you have any suggestion of how one would do that? There's a one equation that has the same left-hand sides in this board, but the right-hand sides are different, right? So, so this and this. So if you, if you equate uh, these uh, two guys here, and you know uh, the in and out, 
mode functions at very early and very late times, you will find some interesting relations between all of these creation and annihilation operators. Okay? But okay, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell you the, the results. So in, in, this, in this example, because it's a quadratic theory, you can do everything. And out equals. <laughs> In out <laughs> times the some exponential minus beta star divided by two alpha a dagger in in. So you can write the out states in terms of the in states, but notice uh, something interesting. So you have the in states, and from the A daggers, you can build a Fox space, right? You just start hit, hitting the in vacuum with these A dagger operators, and you start you know, piling up particles. From, from the point of view of the in frame, the out vacuum has infinitely many particles. You can find, uh, you can find uh, I with a certain probability, non-zero probability, particle states of definite number and arbitrarily high number because it's an exponential of a dagger. Okay? Kind of looks like a, some sort of coherent state of in particles. And this is some matrix element uh, between in and out. And um, right. And then two other interesting facts is that the the matrix elements between in and out states is given by 1 over mod alpha. And if you compute the number operator, hmm, okay, I think in the in vacuum, the number of out particles in the in vacuum. The expectation value of the number operator is given by this coefficient beta squared. And finally, unitarity will tell you that alpha squared minus beta squared is 1. OK, so there's some conservation of probability equation that at, at late times will tell you that alpha squared minus beta squared need to um, subtract off to 1. Okay. So this alpha and beta somehow encode. So alpha tells you how much overlap there will be between the in and the, and the out states. At, at, uh, it's a time independence, but it, tell, it, it gives you information about how, how probable you are to end up in the out vacuum. In particular, if alpha equals 1, then you're back to Feynman, Feynman perturbation theory, and then the probability is 1. And if you compute how many out particles there are in the in, in, the in vacuum, then you find that the answer is uh, proportional to this beta squared. So this Alpha is called, uh, well, alpha and beta are called Bogolyubov coefficients. So somehow they encode all the information about, about the, the fact that you have some non-trivial uh, vacuum at late times, if you start from vacuum at early times. Okay. I'm not going to use this uh, alpha and beta notation in the rest of the lectures, but this is uh, so ingrained and, and basic of Q of T in curved space, I wanted you to see it. But I just want you to extract the physics uh, of this example. The physics is just that if you switch on a source, what I, if, I had, if I started from a state with no particles in the past, at very late times, I will see some non-trivial number of particles in the future. So somehow the source produces particles and from the point of view of some detector that would naively see vacuum at late times, I would see some 
occupied states at late times. Okay? So this is what's going to happen in the case of inflation. We're going to start with like vacuum initial conditions. So naively, there is nothing. And then the expansion of space time provides this uh, time dependence background. And then when I go to very late times, I will see some populated levels of particles. That's what sets up these correlations that I was telling you about. Okay. Questions? So I suggest we take a five minute break. Is five minutes, uh, okay, a yeah, five minute break and then I'll start uh, with the sitter when, when we're back. All right. Okay, so now uh, we're gonna switch gears. I just want, uh, the point of this example was to uh, give you some intuition for why there is particle production once you have a non-trivial time dependence, okay? Uh, and this Bogolyubov coefficient story is uh, very important in the study of quantum field theory in curved backgrounds, but we're not gonna use this technology because it's uh, very convenient for quadratic theories, but eventually we'll be interested in interactions. So the story gets, a, you need a different technique to attack the problem, okay? So let's see, maybe I just, I'll just erase the whole thing and start from, start from scratch. So we're gonna switch gears now, okay? So we're gonna describe now the classical geometry of the sitter space and, uh, and maybe I'll spend some time just uh, explaining the classical geometry of the sitter space and uh, how many symmetries it has and so on because that will, those will be the star of these lectures. The name of the game is how you leverage symmetries to say something about, the, um, about these cosmological correlation functions. Okay, wonderful. All right. So let's start with the sitter space. So the sitter space is the Lorentzian version of the sphere. It's the maximally symmetric solution of Einstein's equations with positive cosmological constants. And it's a very, very good approximation to this inflationary error that sets up those initial conditions for the universe, okay? Uh, one way, one, uh, one uh, good way of thinking about the sitter space is uh, as some hyperbolite embedded in Minkowski space in one higher dimension, okay? So, You have some hyperboloid. Embedded in some higher dimensional space time. And uh, so this is Minkowski. And uh, the hyperboloid has the following equation in terms of its coordinates. So it's a five-dimensional, five-dimensional Minkowski space, and I have this hyperboloid, where this R is the decider radius, okay? So this is classical decider space, and uh, the most convenient, well, so from here, the symmetry of this space-time should be obvious, right? So it has some SO1, 4, because it's like the sphere with a minus sign here. So it has, has some S1, SO1, 4 symmetry group. Uh, isometry group. In particular, it has 10 generators, which is great. It's uh, as powerful. Uh, symmetry-wise as Minkowski space, okay? Ten generators. And uh, for cosmology, we're interested in a different uh, set of coordinates to describe this space-time. 
because we're mostly interested in the expanding. It's a, it's a proxy for an exponentially expanding space-time. So most convenient for cosmology. So the metric I'm going to work with flat slices because, uh, well, one of the points of inflation is to wash out spatial curvature, so it's just convenient to work on this uh, spatial slicing. And so this is probably, you've seen this line elements before, so this is the Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker uh, line element with a particular scale factor, so the scale factor A of t is e to the HT, so it's really exponential expansion of space-time, where H, the Hubble parameter, where H is 1 over R. Yes. Okay. And Another way that's very useful to, uh, if you just go to conformal time, so this is a conformally flat manifold. So this is another way of writing the line elements, okay? Where T runs in the whole real line, where this conformal time eta runs from minus infinity to zero. Okay. All right. So they only cover half of the hyperboloid, but we're only interested in the expanding part of the space-time. So if I do some conformal transformation, I can squash the hyperboloid into a square. This is a Penrose diagram. So the Penrose diagram of the hyperboloid looks like this. It's a little square. And then there's a flat coordinate only cover will only cover half of the space time so these are the flat slices and eta goes to minus infinity is this very early time here and then as i go to very late times eta goes to zero okay all right um, do you want me to show what's the coordinate transformation that does this, or everyone is? Yes, no, maybe. So uh, th there's a way of uh, cutting. So if you if you look at this picture here, so these uh, those coordinates, if you see, are cut in diagonal. They kind of they kind of do something like this. We're cutting with planes, the manifold. But there's a way of uh, slicing it with spheres, right? So here, uh, the spheres in my drawing are just circles. So here, the, the it's very clear that uh, the space-time goes through some contracting phase. So then the sphere gets... Uh, at minimum size, it gets exactly the size of the decider radius. That's where it comes from, at the neck, and then it starts expanding. Okay. So there is a, a if you write things in these coordinates, in these yellow coordinates, they're called global coordinates. So we're going to mostly be using this coordinate system, but just for your general education. So uh, ds squared in these global coordinates, they cover the entire manifold, but you're slicing things with spheres instead of planes. It can be written like this, plus r ds squared cosh squared tau over r ds times some unit line element of the, in this case, the three sphere. Okay, so my my spatial slices are three spheres, and uh, so the cosh is essentially the fact that 
you know, things contract and then expand with this uh, time coordinate tau. And now if you do a small, a small change of, so you go from cosh tau over r, 1 over cosine, you change your time coordinates like this. RBS. Then you get something like this equals one over cosine squared t over r minus dt squared over r squared uh, plus d omega i squared. Okay. So the the Penrose diagram. The idea is to always drop. Uh, some prefactor up front. So this is, uh, so you have some uh, big T, big time coordinates because the cosine blows up. Uh, so this uh, T coordinate runs from, I guess, minus, minus pi over two to plus pi over two. And these are uh, spheres, okay? So, so you have uh, these spatial slices. So those yellow slices up there are slices like this. Okay. So every one of these is a three sphere and every point on the diagram is a two sphere. So if you zoom into every every cut here, it's like a sphere. Of course, you can't visualize anything because it's a three sphere. But okay, there is a, there's an S3 here and every point on the diagram is a two sphere. Unless you're sitting here, in which case it's the pole. So there's the north and the, and the south pole. Okay. So this gives you some idea of the causal structure of this uh, space-time. So now let's uh, look at the symmetries from the point of view of these, of these uh, coordinates. Actually, uh, who here works on string theory? You just raise your hands. Okay, who here knows ADS space? Raise your hands. Okay, so if you know, just a small, uh, a small remark, it's a parenthesis. If you don't care about ADS, you can ignore it. But uh, so if you take eta to uh, IZ and uh, H to I over R ADS, then you get them. There's double analytic continuation. The hyperbolic space for Euclidean ADS, uh, which is uh, the z squared plus the x squared okay. so this is uh, hyperbolic sp space uh, sliced with uh, with planes so this is called uh, the Poincare slicing of um, of uh, hyperbolic space. So this is just a, a small remark. All right, so now let's uh, study the symmetries of this uh, space-time. So there are 10 symmetries. So how many can you identify uh, from the get-go? How many symmetries do you see if you stare at the metric here? Three, six, 10, 12, 12 is wrong. So it's any number less than 10 is acceptable. So if I look just here, it's a, uh, these are spatial coordinates. So there you should identify six isometries just from the dx squared. So there are three translations. X x plus a and uh, three rotations x to some matrix m m i j x j okay so now one if you know ads it's obvious if you have never seen this before it might be a little bit uh, unfamiliar but in particular notice that uh, because which is related to what we did in the first half of the lecture. There is no time translation 
uh, symmetry because of this eta downstairs. So this fellow here doesn't change under time translation, but this one does. But there is something new that kind of compensates for it, which is if I rescale x and eta at the same time, the naive flat space metric, which is upstairs, would rescale by this factor. But now, because there's an eta downstairs, the, it compensates. So there is a new isometry. So there's one so-called so, so dilatation isometry. which uh, takes eta to lambda eta and x to lambda x, OK? So now we're down to three more. To, and these three, well, you can visualize it. Well, you, you must teach me, because uh, it's not obvious at all. So there are three uh, isometries that, of course, from up there, from the embedding space uh, picture, it's obvious it's just some extra rotations that we haven't uh, taken into account. But from these slices, uh, they're kind of complicated. And I'm going to call them, uh, um, so they're usually called the sitter boosts. Because they are morally analogous to boosts in flat space. But I'm going to call them special conformal. transformations for reasons that will become clear later on. So I'll write them down. So there are three of them. They are parameterized by a vector B with three components. And uh, there they are the following. Eta goes to eta over 1 plus 2 B dot x plus b squared x squared minus eta squared and x goes to x plus x squared minus eta squared b divided by the same denominator to be the x plus b squared x squared minus Square. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, quite non-trivial, and he ha yeah, there is a nice mnemonic that well, I actually never thought about it very hard. But if you send eta to zero, so zero goes to zero, so the eta disappears from the equation. But if you send eta to 0, the x transformation remains non-trivial. And here's a quick mnemonic to remember how to write this, at least for eta equals to 0, okay? which um, is related to the name special conformal transformation. So when eta goes to 0, then uh, the x transformation comes from some moves, OK? So you take x. First thing you do is you do what's called inversion. Okay? So you get some new x, which is defined to be as x divided by x squared. So this is called inversion for obvious reasons, right? right? You're, as best as you can, you're sending a vector to its inverse. Of course, inverse of a vector doesn't make sense, so this is the next best thing. So this is called inversion. Then the next thing you do is you translate the inverted vector. So this is where this parameter b comes in. And finally, you invert things again, x. Okay. So this a series of moves is, is called a special conformal transformation. In the end, it boils down to this inversion relation, because this is a translation which is automatically encoded there. So if you understand inversion uh, symmetry, then, uh, then uh, you understand the extra uh, isometries of the sitter. Okay. 
So you can check at home that if you plug this in, the metric, the Bs all cancel out and you get, you get the same uh, metric back, which is quite non-trivial. So these three extra isometries are very powerful, as I'll show you. In, in the sense there, where the, the true juice of working in the sitter versus working in some uh, generic expanding background comes in. So they give you extra constraints on the cosmological fluctuations that essentially allow you to start bootstrapping and writing things without referring to specific theory. Okay. Questions? All right. So now we're going to study the free field. Uh, we're going to do free field theory in this background. We're going to study a, a scalar field in this background. And you see that there's already something new that happens that doesn't quite have a flat space analog, which is related to particle production. But there's also something extra. Notice one thing that's new from uh, the sitter compared to flat space is that there is now an intrinsic lamp scale. So flat space doesn't come with a ruler, but the sitter has an intrinsic ruler, which is this Hubble parameter. Okay? It's uh, how the time scale at which things uh, double in size, in physical size. Okay? All right, so now let's study the free scalar. So here's the action. Yeah, minus a half root g, g mu nu. Uh, okay. So this is the action, and. Um, <laughs> Okay, so now you can go through the same story. And uh, should I do this or not? Okay, I'm probably not going to do it. But all right, so we again, so we have uh, uh, some non-trivial time, time dependence of the metric, but uh, spatial dependence is trivial, just like in flat space. So it's helpful to go from phi of eta x to study Fourier modes. Okay, so we're going to go to phi k of eta. So the time dependence is non-trivial, but we can think of uh, Fourier modes. And uh, because we have a quadratic theory, Fourier modes don't talk to each other, just among themselves. And uh, you can you know, writes the equation of motion for phi k, phi k of eta. Let's see if I wrote it down somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a trick that I, I'm not particularly enamored with, but uh, let's do it. So there is a variable v. This is just to touch base with some of the literature, okay? So there's some variable v that you can define as 1 over h eta times phi. And uh, now in terms of this variable v, the, the action for the scalar field becomes the following. The action becomes 1 half integral. Now I'm uh, pulling the measure. And the eta v, ow, oh, sorry, squared plus, oh, let me, let me go to Fourier modes in a second. Minus 
m over h squared minus 2. v squared over eta squared. Okay. So this variable v, when the mass is zero, is usually referred to as the Mukhanov Sataki variable. Okay. But it's a future definition that essentially, so you see that there is a root g here and a g mu nu, and the g has those factors of eta. So this future definition is just uh, uh, is, is doing a couple of nice things. So one nice thing that it does is that now the kinetic term is more standard. It's like d eta. Okay. And so that so let's uh, stare at this action for a second and make a few comments about it. So first of all. If I go to very early times, if I send eta to minus infinity, so this term goes away, okay? And then this thing becomes just a standard harmonic oscillator action. Okay? It's a massless harmonic oscillator. If I go to Fourier modes, every Fourier mode acts like a mass term, and then I'm back to the standard harmonic oscillator. Then again, we know what to do, right? We know how to quantize. So that's uh, what's going to guide us to quantization. So there is, again, this vacuum ambiguity. But then uh, if we want the universe to begin its life with like standard vacuum initial conditions, we want, as eta goes to minus infinity, we want this, uh, the mode functions to be such that this is our standard uh, harmonic oscillator mode functions. Okay? So this is one thing. Another piece of intuition for why we would like things to behave like that at early times is that notice that if I look, if I look at these uh, matrix elements, as I go to the, the true physical length, uh, uh, the physical, if I track some uh, some modes, okay, of a, of a given uh, wave number, then you see we're we're Fourier transforming in these coordinates x, okay, but the true physical wavelength of a particle, it's really being red shifted by this exponential factor, e to the ht x, okay? So it's important to, to, to notice that even if I'm working at fixed separation in x space, if I go to very early times, the separation was much smaller. And if I go to very late times, the separation becomes very big, okay? which is just the fact that the space time is expanding. In particular, if I work at a fixed uh, co-moving wave number, the wave number set by these coordinates x, if I go to very early times, the, the modes will have a very short wavelength. So it can't possibly know that it's in curved space. It's probing just very short distance physics. It doesn't feel the effects of curvature. The effects of curvature will kick in much later once the physical wavelength of this mode becomes comparable to the length scale now I, I erase it, but the length scale set by the Hubble parameter. Is that clear? So this is the, this is the intuition for why at early times you're going to pick standard vacuum initial conditions. Okay? Now if we look at the mass term, there is a couple of interesting things. First of all, if, uh, if I go to very late times, this mass term becomes overwhelming. So the particle is becoming very heavy in some sense. Okay? So the, the, the idea is that the fluctuations freeze. Uh, the, the, the quantum field stops fluctuating. Okay? So this is something about uh, the mass term. Second thing is that now there is a notion of light and heavy, which doesn't have flat space analog, you see? So in flat space, we have light or heavy particles. Okay, there is massless and massive. Okay, and calling something massive or heavy, you need to have an experiment. You need to introduce an extra scale in the problem, which are the scales that you probe. But from the point of view of representation theory, there is only two kinds of particles, massless and massive. In the sitter, now, there are three kinds of particles. There is massless, there is massive, and there is 
light because it's light with respect to the length scale set by the decider radius. Okay. So here we see that this turnover, uh, roughly speaking, happens at m over h order 1 because uh, this mass term for a very small m even becomes sort of tachyonic in these coordinates. And then for a very heavy m much bigger than h, it becomes your standard mass term, albeit with this redshift effect. Okay. So there's something new about representation theory because, again, the notion of particle is very much tied to the symmetries of the arena where the particles live. So because now our arena is the center space and not flat space, uh, the representation theory does change. Okay? In fact, maybe towards the end of the lectures, I'm going to, the situation for spinning particles becomes very interesting, even a little bit bizarre. We don't understand exactly how to think of spinning particles in the sitter. Okay? All right. I, in particular, noticed last thing, when m is equals to equals 2, so these terms in Hubble units, these terms precisely cancel. So then this becomes identical, modulo this field redefinition here, becomes identical to a particle in flat space. Okay, so the m squared equals 2 is called the conformally coupled scalar because if the mass is equal to 2, then the scalar field doesn't care that it's in an expanding space time. It might as well be in flat space. You get pretty much the same action, okay, modulo this redshift factor. All right? So now we can uh, proceed as, uh, as usual. So the equation of motion, classical equation of motion for a given Fourier mode uh, looks something like this. d eta squared vk plus k squared plus m squared minus 2h squared over h squared eta squared vk equals zero. Okay. So again, let's. I'm just repeating here in the board what I told you. So the representation theory is a little bit funny. So if I plot m over h, then uh, special things happen. So there are two special points here in the line. So first of all, you want mass to be bigger than zero. But then mass equals to 0 and mass equals to 2 are special. Uh, well, maybe, let me put m squared. Do I have to? So there is some, uh, some region kind of in between where here uh, the idea is that you have this overdamped fluctuations. So the fluctuations freeze out. Then here you have some crossover. So you have some critical regime. And right, finally, for very light mass, there's something special that happens that uh, Redshift doesn't attenuate fluctuations. So you see, again, as eta goes to zero, the mass term is becoming very heavy. So you'd expect the fluctuations freeze out and they actually start, start to redshift. And so their power starts to go down. But if the mass is very light, you have some competition between this tachyonic instability and the uh, and, uh, expansion of space-time, and you leave some non-trivial imprint. And so that's the intuition for why uh, good stuff happens for very, very light scalars. Okay. 
So the equation itself, uh, well, it's uh, not entirely trivial, but uh, thankfully it's some Bessel equation. Okay? So you can write you can write the solution in terms if you you can't write it in terms of elementary functions, but you can write it in terms of some Bessel function. Um, I can write it, but it's not gonna rock your world or anything. It's, So the VK of eta, that, uh, the, the, the one that agrees with the harmonic oscillator early times is given by this, where I'm being really careful, hopefully, with uh, the details. E to the I to new. Trust me, you don't need this for the rest of the lectures, but I just, just to believe that I, I solved the equation. H new uh, one minus k eta. So this is the Hunkel function of the first kind. So H new of one is like the Bessel function, the standard Bessel function plus the modified Bessel function. So it has the nice property that it, uh, if I send this argument to infinity, if I send eta to minus infinity, so I send this argument to plus infinity. It behaves like a, a single frequency um, oscillator. Okay? So it's, I'm picking this Hunkel function such that at early times, as eta goes to minus infinity, it behaves like e to the uh, minus i k eta. Okay? Because the, the notice that we don't have energy conservation, but because the absolute value of the spatial momentum will appear playing a role very similar to energy, I'm going to use during the lectures the idea that k, which is really just the absolute value of the spatial momentum, is like energy. There is no energy conservation, but this is a very useful analogy. And you'll see it's not just words. It actually, in some sense, is related to energy that I'll explain later. So this is the mode function at early times. It behaves like a harmonic oscillator, like uh, we, I was trying to argue for. If the mass is very heavy, so a couple of uh, observations. If the mass is very heavy, in Hubble units, <laughs> then at late times, VK of eta will be. So this formula that I'm going to write here is only true for, for uh, M over H much bigger than 1. So VK of eta will behave like... Um, Minus eta. Maybe I don't want to write this. So I'm sweeping some stuff under the rug, but I just want to make a point. Eta to the I m over h c1 plus some coefficients that depend on the mass. Eta to the minus I m over h c2. Okay. So if you look at this uh, formula, what does that remind you from half an hour ago? Hopefully it reminds you of something. So now I'm going to late times. I'm sending eta to zero. And it's a little bit funny, but um, at early times, the analogy works best if I think of eta itself. So it, the mode function really goes like a harmonic oscillator. But here, here at late times, you get this power loss. So then it's useful to go back to eta equals e to the uh, minus ht over h or something like that. And then you get e to the minus i m t c1 e to the plus i m t c2. So now hopefully, it, yeah. This formula? 
this formula were I, I forgot to define what nu is. Right? Nu is the mass of the particle written in a convenient way. Nu squared equals, sorry about that. Okay, so maybe that helps. So this formula is true for any mass, and uh, hopefully there will be examples in which the Hankel function collapses to something simple. But, so now coming back here, you see that at late times, I have some linear combination, even though I, I imposed, again, it's a little bit funny because at early times I do want to use conformal time, and at late times I need to go back to coordinate time to make the analogy precise. But you see, now I have a linear combination of positive and negative frequency mode functions. Okay? So I have particle production. So the fact that I get non-trivial C2 is particle production. What I'm sweeping under the rug is that the whole uh, particle production rate is also being redshifted by the expansion of space-time. So that's why, in the end, we're only interested in very light particles, because then this tachyonic instability and the redshift effects kind of compensate each other. But then the particle production analogy becomes less clear. Okay, so this particle production uh, language is very good for heavy fields. So that's why I don't want to commit to those Bogolyubov coefficient story. But if you think uh, of this C1 and C2 in terms of these Bogolyubov coefficients, then uh, if you were to compute, the, remember that I wrote two formulas, one related to the overlap between the in and the out vacuum, and, and the other was related to the number, particle number. So uh, now here it looks like it makes sense in terms of this coordinate time to think in terms of a particle detector, and I see some number of particles. So if I compute at a given, at a fixed um, a mode number, the number of particles for a given co-moving wavelength from the point of view of this, uh, of this earlier in vacuum, the number of out particles that I see is given by this formula here. 1 over e to the minus m over t ds minus 1 where TDS is H over 2 pi. So if I look, uh, yeah, so first of all, the, the information about the wave number is washed out because of redshift. But if I look at this formula, what does that remind you of? It's for some occupation number. From statistical mechanics. So it's the Bose distribution, right? So it's the Bose distribution of a, a system in thermal equilibrium at the temperature, at some temperature set up, uh, fixed by the Hubble scale. Okay. So this, for heavy fields, there is some uh, more or less precise sense in which you can think of this uh, the sitter space as some thermal box at some fixed temperature. Okay. So people use this all the time, and. Uh, theoretical physics, they all, all, always talk about as the sitter as some background uh, that operates at finite temperatures. So this is just one quick way of seeing where this analogy comes from. Okay? And you can use the whole uh, machinery of Euclidean field theory and, and Euclidean quantum gravity to make this more precise, which is what Gibbons and Hawking did. But um, again, this analogy, at least at the level of uh, particle detectors, works very well for heavy particles. Okay? So the notion of, uh, of having particle detectors at late times and so on is not very good for light particles. Okay? So I just wanted to bring this up so that you understand where the Sitter temperature comes from. But uh, we're going to forget about the Sitter temperature after this. Okay? Yeah. Sorry, say that again. No, the temperature is actually is constant because in some coordinates uh, you can think of the, so for the coordinates in which this temperature analogy works the best, you can think of the sitter as a static space-time. So the, the temperature is really always the same. 
because it's set up by the Hubble radius, so there can't be some dynamical temperature. Am I? Okay. So uh, I'm, before I stop, I just want to spell out this formula for uh, two important cases. Uh, so the first important case is that of uh, the, so the, the two masses for which I can write something not terribly complicated. So two special cases, and these will be our, uh, our partners for a long time in these lectures. So two special cases. And now I'm going to go back to phi instead of vk. Remember that phi and vk are related to each other by this uh, 1 over h eta factor. So v equals 1 over h eta phi. But now for m squared equals 2, then phi k, this is called the conformally coupled scalar. Phi k of eta is e, eta e to the minus i k eta. So it's pretty much like a harmonic oscillator mode function, but instead of the energy being square root of k squared plus m squared, the energy is just square root of k squared. And for m squared equals 0, in particular, notice that at late times, the power is red shifting away. But there's some nice simplicity related to the fact that the mode function is like the mode function of flat space. But now, uh, if, uh, if, the m, if the m, let me even change notation. If the mass is 0, I'll call this field big phi, phi k of eta. And then the mode function looks like this, 1 plus So it's slightly more complicated, but you can write it in terms of elementary functions. And in particular, notice that when I send eta to 0, it doesn't go to 0. It doesn't write shifts anymore. So as eta goes to 0, which is what I was alluding to before, it goes to 1, Okay, the mode function. So it means that you do leave some imprint at late times. Okay? So that's why we're, we'll be interested mostly in very light or for practical purposes, massless fields, because they do leave an imprint at late times, unlike massive fields, the redshift. Okay. So these are two special cases that we're going to work uh, with mostly throughout the lectures. So um, after lunch, I'm going to say a few things more about uh, free field representations, but I'm mostly going to talk about uh, their two-point correlation function in quantum field theory. And then we're going to see how this story works in the specific example of inflation, okay? how these two-point functions arise from the study of inflation. Okay? So I'll stop here. <laughs>